Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. I'm really excited for this conversation here. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hughes. I'm the equities reporter at Bloomberg covering many Canadian companies, among them Fiera Capital. So I'm very excited uh, that we have the chairman and CEO Jean-Guy Desjardins um, here today. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about with market turbulences. So let's dive right in. Um, I wanted to start with sort of a thousand look view or thousand foot view of what you're seeing in the markets right now, what you expect to see. 2023 was something of a volatile year and it wasn't until the end of the year that we saw some sort of uh, foothold there. So um, taking the macroeconomic element of it, the markets, um, can you walk us through uh, your thoughts on the markets, where we could be headed and uh, some of the uh, inflation data we saw today? And we have 30 minutes to answer <laughs> that question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, bonjour à tout le monde, ça fait plaisir d'être ici. Uh, uh, talk, talking about market expectations, uh, it's quite interesting and I'd like to go to what market expectations were yesterday. Uh, I think it's important to set, uh, set the, the stage here and what market expectations are today because we had a CP, uh, CPI print uh, this morning in the US which was a very a surprising one on, on the downside, on the positive side. And that has shifted market expectations quite meaningfully today, especially for the US. So if I, if I go back to the global picture, it, it was interesting to see that uh, we were heading into what I would describe as the beginning of a coordinated, uh, almost global uh, move in central bank policy interest rate decisions towards normalization. Okay. And uh, normalization in the sense of going from a, an interest rate policy where real rates are uh, contract, contractionary and uh, moving to a neutral rate which is neither expansionary or contractionary. Okay. And if we take uh, in Canada, for example, from uh, where we are today, it's probably uh, 175 basis points. The neutral rate would be something like 3%. And uh, we are looking at the situation where for the Bank of Canada, for the European Central Bank, uh, a little bit later, but most likely for the UK Central Bank and even for the Chinese Central Bank, we were on the edge of uh, potentially initiating, that's a scenario, but potentially initiating a coordinated move towards normalization of central bank policy decisions, okay? which means interest rates going down probably most likely over the next 18 months, which is between now and the end of 2025, okay. which was a very, very positive development in the outlook for the, the global economy based on the fact that lower interest rates would stimulate the global economy. And we're looking at 2025 being a year where the global economy would grow faster than 2024. Okay. The US was sort of uh, outside of that pattern because the outlook for U.S. inflation was that they were a little bit sort of stuck around that 3% level. And when you look at the six or seven key conditions required for central banks to initiate uh, an adjustment uh, to a neutral position on rates, those conditions and all of those conditions were not met in the U.S. So the U.S. central bank, the Fed, was not in a position to initiate a move towards neutralization of their uh, interest rate policy. So we had this, uh, this separation okay, between a number of countries going in the direction which was right for them based on their economic conditions, where the US was not part of that movement. And it's a big part of the global economy, as you know. Okay? So interestingly enough, this morning, uh, the CPI uh, print, uh, the core CPI came out at uh, an annualized rate of 2%, which was a surprise. Okay? Uh, and uh, that has shifted market expectations where it has now opened the window. This print, has, uh, and, and I'll come back to, to the number itself, but this print has created expectations in market this morning where it opens the window to the guarantee like fully discounted in markets, half of, half of 1%, 50 basis point decline in Fed funds rate between now and year end. And the probability, which is not, probability is like 60% probability 
that there might be even a third decline, so 75 basis points, okay, between now and year end. And that's all, co all conditioned on the fact that because of that CPI, core CPI print this morning, that it has shifted those expectations. Okay. Uh, it's very, very dangerous, and that's markets, okay? But it's very dangerous to react to a monthly uh, piece of data, okay, which is that CPI print this morning. And uh, uh, our people, uh, what we do is we analyze the distribution of the components of, a, of the CPI or the PCE in, when, when they come out. And the results that we have on, from the analysis of the distribution of the components of that core CPI number is that it is highly, highly improbable that that CPI result that came out today is the beginning of a trend that will continue in the next few months because the distribution of the components does not support that at all. In fact, the distribution of the components have deter has deteriorated from the previous few months, okay, like the last two or three months. Okay. So uh, I think caution is very important here. And we work with probabilities on different scenarios. And uh, I think what's interesting is the highest probability scenario right now, which is against what market expectations have built into, uh, into valuation right now, uh, is still that you have a number of countries that will continue to move towards a neutralization of interest rates, which where interest rates will be coming down, which I've mentioned a little bit earlier, and that the U.S. will continue for a while to be on the sideline uh, in terms of their ability to move to a, a lower interest rate policy, which doesn't mean that they, they may do 25 basis points uh, because it's a world of uncertainty and uh, because of the high degree of uncertainty about the outlook for inflation, but also about the outlook for the economy, because the reality is since, uh, since the beginning of 2022, we've been, uh, uh, we've been absorbing from an economic point of view, a level of real interest rates, which normally should have an impact on economic activity. And we've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in Europe, we've seen it in the UK, but we haven't seen it in the US, okay, which is, why they have that, that problem in, in sort of joining the other central banks and that move towards a, a, a neutral interest rate. So that's, that, I would say, is the current situation, but I would stick to the high probability scenario. But uh, if, I, if I can add to that, uh, <clears throat> since we're, we're operating in a world of uncertainty, I think working, taking the time to think about outcomes and scenarios is very, very important and useful. And what what this CPI print has, uh, has created today is the possibility. Now, there, there is this possibility, okay, of an economic scenario where uh, it's possible to think that somewhere by the middle or towards the end of 2025, that central bank interest rate policies could become stimulative if the impact of the real rates that we have lived with for the last couple of years finally catches up to economic activity and we end up having, having an economic environment that's too slow where unemployment goes up and then central banks would be in a position to go to an interest rate policy where real rates would be negative and policy would be stimulative. That's a scenario that two, three months ago we would not have had. Okay? So things are sort of moving in a, in a pretty positive uh, direction right now, and including the latest data, even for the U.S. Okay. So it's a long answer to a tough question, by the way. So, uh. For sure, and I really appreciate all the context. And I wanted to pull on that thread of uncertainty and shifting uh, market expectations. Um, how does Fiera Capital actually navigate these uncertainties around economic data, um, the unclear rate of um, interest rates, uh, or a path of interest rates, I should say, and... Um, everything else thrown in between, like geopolitics, um, what have you. So is it more of like a long-term focus plan or do you have to pivot between um, each uncertainty that, and challenge that comes your way? Yeah, well, uh, well, the answer to that question for us is not to uh, operate or function or react to uh, short-term results and to try to uh, sort of uh, forecast and make decisions on the outlook for the next uh, six months, okay? So we focus on uh, the outlook for the next 18 months. So we're more preoccupied right now 
to come up with economic scenarios, because that's how you deal with uncertainty, by having different economic outcomes, uh, uh, trying to uh, identify uh, what's the range of possible economic outcomes that could materialize by the second half of 2025. And I'll tell you, that's a lot easier to do than trying to forecast what's going to happen in the next three or four months. And most people do the opposite, but uh, that's how we deal with the uncertainty you referred to. So we develop economic scenarios, economic outcomes, and within each one of these economic outcomes, our job is to obviously develop capital market forecast, expectations of rates of return on different asset classes. And uh, we, we apply a probability judgment. At the end, uh, that's what central bankers do, and that's what, as investment people making investment decisions for our clients, that's what we do. We apply a probability judgment on those scenarios, and the highest probability scenario is the one that will sort of influence the direction of our investment decisions, okay? So uh, that's, that's how we deal with it, and uh, uh, our experience has been positive in our ability to create value for our clients by doing it in this manner. But we don't, we don't operate in a world of certainty, that's for sure, okay? Uh, we, if we have uh, three different economic scenarios or four different economic outcomes, the probabilities are allocated across the four economic outcomes. Absolutely, and no one has a crystal ball, so that makes things more difficult. Um, I want to get a private equity question in here because uh, there was interesting commentary from another summit in uh, Toronto where the, uh, the strategist from uh, the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan described uh, private equity in a um, high interest rate environment, uh, perhaps with expectations of higher for longer rates, uh, described private equity as a entering a lost decade or being in a lost decade, uh, what kind of opportunities are you seeing in private equity and are you seeing um, a rotation um, towards the space? Uh, well, uh, everybody, for everybody who's familiar with the private equity business, uh, as you know, it's very much dependent on financial, uh, financial architecture and very much uh, dependent on the level of interest rates because they're highly leveraged uh, 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 strategies. Uh, but obviously, you have to believe that we're going to have high real interest rates. That's the important part, high real interest rates. Uh, the U.S., uh, five and a quarter. The neutral rate is 3%. So the U.S. right now is operating with a real rate of two and a quarter. So that's the problem. Okay, that's tightness. Uh, but if you have expectations that we're going to have uh, real interest rates in the U.S. and in Canada and in Europe, uh, for the next few years, not for the next six months, but for the next two or three years, you would come to that conclusion, okay? Uh, obviously, this is not, like I just expressed a few minutes ago, it's not the highest probability scenario that we have. It, it is one, but it's not the highest probability one, okay? And I would say right now that there's probably as much of a probability of having a period of sustained high interest rates as there's a probability of the scenario that I just brought up of having uh, a set of conditions in uh, nine months from now, 12 months from now, where we could go to negative real rates, which would go con con significantly against that comment, okay? So uh, uh, th that conclusion is very much predicated on what kind of assumptions you have on the outlook for interest rates over the next two or three years, or even five years for that matter. You know? Absolutely. And speaking of um, interest rates and central bank dynamics, uh, uh, you alluded to this in your opening remarks, uh, Bank of Canada cut by a quarter of a uh, percentage point uh, um, yep. per percent uh, last week. Yep. And uh, there's some expectation that the Fed might take a little bit longer to, to cut. Uh, so with that sort of divergent dynamic, um, or if, if it does continue, if the Bank of Canada does continue to cut deeper and, um, and faster than the Fed, uh, what does the scenario um, that you have uh, look like for the markets in that case if uh, the, the Fed kind of waits a little bit longer? Uh, uh, that, that's quite interesting. And uh, 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 markets right now are, are fully discounting that the Bank of Canada will reduce rates by another half percent between now and the end of the year and a lower probability that it might be three quarters of a percent in Canada. Okay. Uh, and that's in the market. Okay. So uh, it sort of gives, a, a, I'd say, a, 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 it opens comfortably the table for the Bank of Canada to go ahead in its policy to gradually move towards a neutral position by sometime in 2025, okay? Because it's in the markets. 
if, if the Bank of Canada was to obviously uh, shift uh, and go to a policy where they would not implement that kind of interest rate adjustment in the next uh, few months, you would see a movement in markets because expectations would change. Okay? So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, as, uh, I, I believe that it's right for the Bank of Canada. The conditions are right from our analysis, and obviously the, the statements coming out of the governor of the bank, that the conditions are right for the Bank of Canada to gradually move to a neutral stance, which for them would be to go uh, down uh, from here uh, 175 basis points okay, over the next 18 months or something. Right? So uh, uh, that it's nice to see that the markets have not dramatically or significantly reacted to that expectation. Like the Keynesian dollar is, hasn't moved that much, okay, a little bit, but not that much, and it's in there. It's already embedded in, in markets. So uh, I, I think you would put a high probability that the Bank of Canada will basically have the flexibility to implement their policy given that the fundamentals continue to support that kind of policy over the next few months. Absolutely, and hopefully uh, we might get some more details when uh, Governor Tiff Macklin takes the stage later this afternoon. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, one question about, uh, or uh, sort of like a um, kind of a, a question of how you're navigating this. So, we, we, over the past few years, we've seen the pan once in a lifetime pandemic, a dramatic economic recovery in some um, areas, geopolitical tensions, every like just a parade of very dramatic events uh, that we've all had to go through, Fiera Capital included. Um, what were some of your biggest lessons learned over this really dramatic period where it seems like uh, some of the old rules don't apply or like that nothing makes sense? Uh, uh, what were some of your biggest takeaways and lessons learned in all this? On the geopolitical side, uh, I, uh, I would say uh, that don't expect the worst. You, I, think, I think being relatively optimistic about the outcome has a higher probability of being right, then putting the highest probability on an outcome, which would be a disaster scenario, like it gets a lot worse, okay? Which is not to say that it won't happen, but I'm just, my experience is that it, the worst case doesn't materialize, okay? It may, but it hasn't historically, okay? In situations like that, okay? We're talking about local conflicts here, okay? So uh, uh, that, 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 that's my, experience of the last 50 years, okay? So, uh, now you know my age, okay? So, uh, <laughs> last 50 years. Uh, uh, as far as, as this one, and it's interesting because uh, when, when you look at, well, one way to assess that, okay, is look at where 10-year rates are treasuries in the US or 10-year rates in Canada, it's everywhere. Okay? What, what those 10-year rates are discounting right now, okay? And you know, a a 10-year uh, interest rate is, is sort of built by midterm inflation expectations plus a real rate, okay? So, uh, so midterm inflation expectations is 2.5%, the real rate is 75, you're at 325, and uh, uh, you look at uh, U.S. 10-year uh, rates right now, 426 or something like that, and, it's, uh, and what you have to add to the computation of what the level of 10-year rate should be is the famous term premium. And the term premium is the uncertainty about the geopolitical part of life and the uncertainty about the longer term outlook, 10 years. You know, you're putting your money to work for 10 years. So what's the outlook for the economy, for inflation, for interest rates, and for uncertainties like geopolitical events? And the term premium right now is lower than the historical average, okay? which means that what's embedded in the markets right now is the scenario where the, the geopolitical environment and the inflation environment and the interest rate environment will not be n that negative, okay? So there's, there's a bias towards things will get better rather than things will get worse. Okay? That's embedded in that 10-year interest rate that we see everywhere globally. Okay? Right, so it sounds like a very optimistic lesson that you're taking with you for the next few years uh, there. Um, were there any surprises over the past few years that you didn't expect that, uh, that actually caught you off guard there? Sorry, I missed the end of your question. Just any uh, surprises that caught you off guard as a business leader that uh, uh, oh. throughout the past well, few years here? Uh, if, if you go back over, well, I don't want to go back to uh, 2008, you know, the bubble, you know. Uh, uh, 
It's interesting because in 2007, the highest probability forecast, because real interest rates went up significantly starting in 2006 and 2007, and the highest probability outcome for 2008 was that the economy would go into recession. Okay? And uh, it did. Well, what well, I guess very few people forecasted, I can tell you we didn't. Okay? We didn't have a scenario where we had a, a real estate bubble that would blow up. Okay? But it blew up because of higher interest rates and because of the economic recession. The combination of those two things just blew up the bubble. Okay? So that was a big surprise. Okay? Not the recession, but the bubble. Okay? The other surprise was obviously the pandemic, COVID in 2020, okay? And uh, uh, the other big surprise is that a vaccine was approved, in fact, two, if I remember, initially, and three even, very shortly. Vaccines were approved at the end of 2020, okay? And uh, it's interesting because going, going back, uh, going back to the beginning of 2020, around March, the governments were looking at a situation where there was a big cliff, there was a big hole, and they had no idea about how long that hole was, and they had to build a bridge to support people that were out of work, that weren't making any money to pay for their food and their uh, rent and everything that they have to deal with. So they had to support the population with fresh cash, but they had no clue about how much and for how long, because they had no clue about how deep this thing was and how long it would last. So they had to build a bridge, okay? It's like building a bridge, but you, had, you don't know if it's going to be a short bridge, a medium size, or a long one. So they took no chance. They went for the long one to make sure, okay? And since the vaccine came at the end of 2020, the end result was that they built a bridge that was too long. Like fiscal policy turned out to be more too stimulative. And that had an impact on eventually on the inflation numbers. There's other factors, supply chain and a lot of other factors. But obviously that created a lot of uh, excess real disposable income savings that took in the U.S. almost now three years to basically get rid of that. Okay, So it stimulated uh, consumer demand and uh, consumption and all that. Okay, So, so that, that was a surprise. Okay, The fact that those vaccines to deal with COVID came as fast as the end of 2020. That was a surprise. A good, positive surprise, so that was a surprise. And it had a big impact on, you know, you remember 2021 was a boom year, you know, it was a great year, markets did extremely well. And then we had the inflation problem and then 22 and 23 and the high rate period and all that. Okay, that's not, that was not a surprise, okay? So uh, anyway, that's it, yeah. Really appreciate that context. And uh, yeah, it seemed like um, rapid succession of many surprises that everybody was uh, hard pivoting towards. And I think it's uh, a moment of history that we're all going to be talking about for decades. A long to come. time. Yeah. A long yeah. time. Um, so we're coming up to time here and I don't have time to squeeze in one last question, but I just wanted to say I really appreciate you um, coming uh, to, you. <laughs> coming today. And I want to appreciate Appreciate the audience uh, for being here, and uh, thank you to the Conference of Montreal for uh, inviting us to speak. Uh, thank you. Merci à tous, et j'espère que vous avez une bonne journée.